Good morning, and welcome to the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy's live weekly broadcast. I'm Roberta Oster, the Communications Director. Our program brings you news and analysis about economic, racial, social, and environmental justice issues here in Virginia. We bring the expertise and perspective of legislators, community members, policy experts, and faith leaders. We keep you informed and we keep our elected officials accountable. And in keeping with our mission, we'll share resources and opportunities for you to get involved in our work advancing social justice and helping our neighbors. And this broadcast is interactive. Please ask questions of our guests on this Facebook feed. We value your participation. And now to today's broadcast. I am pleased to welcome our special guest, Delegate Sia Price, who is the chief patron of House Bill 1255. And she will be speaking with Benjamin Hoyne, the Policy and Programs Director of the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy. We are thrilled to have you both here today. And first, some background before we begin. This show is a follow-up conversation to our September 24th broadcast about the pros and cons of Amendment 1. One of the most prevalent concerns we received in the feedback for that show was that if Amendment 1 fails on the ballot this year, folks will have to wait another 10 years to address gerrymandering in Virginia. The Virginia Interface Center has not taken an official position on Amendment 1. We are committed to presenting both sides of the issue to inform voters. So in today's show, we are going to raise awareness about House Bill 1255 and how it aims to end gerrymandering in Virginia. The initial show we had planned was called The Better Way Forward to End Gerrymandering in Virginia, HB 1255 or Amendment 1. And we hope to have legislators who were patrons on both pieces of legislation. We invited four different patrons of Amendment 1 to join us, but unfortunately, due to scheduling conflicts, none could be confirmed. As part of our voter education resources, we have been in communication with Delegate Schuyler Van Valkenburg's office with both his and Delegate Price's review and input. We are designing a one-pager that will provide a side-by-side -side look from the perspective of patron legislators at how these two pieces of legislation will end racial and political gerrymandering in Virginia. And now to our broadcast. Again, I'm pleased to welcome our special guest, Delegate Sia Price, Chief Patron of House Bill 1255, and my colleague and friend, Benjamin Hoyne. Ben? Thanks, Roberta and Delegate Price. Welcome to you. It's always uh, wonderful to have you here. Uh, such a champion for economic justice that that you received the uh, Virginia Interface Center's Economic Justice uh, Award just uh, uh, a year ago or something like that. So, um, and unfortunately, as, as Roberta mentioned, we we were unable to get anyone from the uh, a legislator uh, patron of Amendment One to join us today. But I think it's really great that we have an opportunity to talk about HB twelve fifty five. Uh, it doesn't garner as much attention as it should. So. Uh, it's wonderful that we're able to kind of take take a deep dive into the the policy and the effects of of HB 1255. So, wanted to start off and and ask if you could kind of summarize the law and and kind of the the road to passage it had during this last regular session, uh, you know, this past winter, uh, and then just kind of tell folks about HB 1255. Thank you, excuse me, and thank you for having me here this morning. I'm dealing with a couple of allergies, but. Um, but thank you. Yeah. So, you know, this this is part of the conversation that uh, has not gotten the most attention because I think um, people should understand that we were dealing with redistricting in two different tracks. And one was how the district should be drawn. And then the other was who should draw the districts. And of course, who should draw the districts uh, was the more contentious conversation. And so uh, how the districts are drawn was really um, a conversation of what are our values and uh, 
I have been in the General Assembly since 2016, but since 2017, I have been fighting for what we call a criteria bill. And that is something that lays out what districts have to have and what they can't have. And that's where we got with House Bill 1255. And so one of the, the I think more progressive parts about this is the fact that, you know, um, we have not found a situation yet. So I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but we have not found a situation yet in the country where a new party comes into power and one of the first bills that they pass is something preventing them from gerrymandering uh, because this does make it illegal. Now, I know that there are all types of gerrymandering, but the three that we could name and focus on were racial, political, and prison. So I want to start with prison gerrymandering because that's where I get most of the questions. I think a lot of people understand the other one. Prison gerrymandering is where there are people that are incarcerated. And of course, they come from where they live and their community and are often put in a different part of the state. And in Virginia, that happens to be out west. Well, out west does not reflect outside of the facility as it does the inside of the facility. And what we were finding was that though the federal census demands that they be counted um, in the facility where they are April 1st of any year that the census was done, for the purpose of political um, districts for uh, for redistricting, they were still counted at that facility. But we were hard pressed to find uh, delegate senators or Congress people uh, that were really treating inmates uh, and those who are incarcerated as constituents. And so, you know, I was the one that was getting letters from those that were being housed out West, but lived in our area. And then it was really interesting when you find out in Virginia that you lose your voting rights if you're convicted of a felony. So in order to get um, districts that would follow through the Voting Rights Act, Black people who were incarcerated and unable to vote were being counted as part of the population in order to get those districts. And it made it look like there were more Black people living there or a, a part of the community. Um, but, but that just isn't the case. And so what House Bill 1255 did and what very few states, but a few other states have done is say, okay, federal census, that's the federal. We're not changing how they are counted for the purposes of the census. But as Virginia uses that information for redistricting, what can we do? And now we have this provision that says, if we know the address at the time of incarceration, that person will be counted at that address instead of at the facility. And then of course, if the address is unknown or if the federal entities uh, decide not to give that information, which was the case right now, uh, they would be counted at the facility. So it's not perfect yet. We're still trying to see how we can play with the federal level to make sure that they get more of that information to us so that we can uh, move forward with this. Uh, but that is what prison gerrymandering was and how we ended it or are working uh, to end it as we perfect the system. But we got a um, we got a report from the Joint Reapportionment Committee where the staff at the Division of uh, Legislative Services uh, has received information from the state level. And there are thousands of individuals who this year or next year when we do redistricting will be counted in their community. And then, of course, what's been um, part of it so that um, we can have the conversation on political and racial gerrymandering, it, uh, it outlines about eight things that the nine things that the map can and can't do. And that's where you get these provisions that are really, um, that are really about not being able to heavily favor a political party or disenfranchise a political party and to stop the packing and cracking of African-American and communities of color uh, that had happened prior to the, the lines um, that the special master drew in 2019. So I will say this, I know that you all are a nonpartisan organization, so I am just stating a fact that you can look at the voting record. House Bill 1255 did pass with every single Democrat supporting it in both the House and the Senate. 
and every single Republican voting against it and the House and the Senate. And so um, I really do believe that that the bills that we pass are value statements. And so uh, what what can get covered as a Democratic value statement for the General Assembly is that gerrymandering is bad. So that's that's it in a nutshell. We can dive into the weeds as far as you want to go, Ben, but that's the, the higher higher level uh, summary of it. That's great. I, I, I would love to dive into the weeds personally. I hope our, our viewers will as well. I mean, so you covered prison gerrymandering and, and what the, the progress that HB 1255 makes on that. Can you touch on racial and political gerrymandering for 1255 as well? Sure. So and um and and one of the one of the things that I would love for folks to do is read along with me because I am going to say what I believe and what I feel, but it is always good for people to do their own uh, research. And so uh, we have a tiny URL link that we would love for uh, for folks to uh, to really read the bill. And that's what's important. You'll have summaries, you'll have people talking about it. Uh, but that link is tinyurl.com and then HB 1255 info. And so thank you to your team for that. <laughs> but uh, tinyurl.com, HB 1255 info, and there's a, a backslash in there, a forward slash in there. Um, but so what had been done in 2011 was that, and admittedly, both sides, multiple races, <laughs> like these are legislators that kind of struck a deal that they would equally gerrymander so that, you know, this side would have some of their stuff and this side would have some of their stuff and we would move forward. Now, I would argue that one side was better at that than the other, but uh, but it was a bipartisan effort to, uh, to gerrymander. But what they were doing was, and I'll take the 95th district uh, that I have the honor to serve as an example, but both were largely part of uh, Newport News. And Newport News is long and skinny. And what kind of happened, no, what happened uh, to a surgical degree uh, of intentionality was that the 94th district was kind of the white Republican district and the 95th district became the heavier black and democratic district. Um, and so for years and years and years, you know, it's just been a lot of black folks. <laughs> so I, I joked before it was redistrict, I could not find white people. Like I had to seek them out in my district but literally could throw a rock across the street into the other district where uh, African-American and communities of color had been drawn out. There was an apartment complex that uh, was largely Latinx and literally straight line box, boxed it out to put it into the 95th. What that does is a couple of things. And, and this is for the racial gerrymandering. By packing so many African-Americans into one district, you really dilute the power and the, the weight of the vote for that community. The other thing is the representation has some very specific issues that they of course have to speak to by appropriately representing that community that the way economics also plays because you have this intersectionality of race, class, and gender. The other delegate for the same city never really had to talk about the um, the radiating effects of, of impoverished conditions, gun violence, or, you know, it was, he got to talk about corporations and, and taxes and business uh, incentives. And I'm literally sitting here talking about life and death things. So he was not being held accountable to the same city and uh, and that was in the in the previous years. And, and this is no knock whether he was a nice person or not. It's just the political issues that his constituency was pulling on him for versus what mine was. And so if we're looking at the 401 year history of disenfranchisement in all of these different areas that uh, black people have in order to navigate the world. Newport News is not immune from that. You know, we have we certainly have our issues. Now, I have the pleasure of doing that because I was born and raised here and I know a lot of what's going on. And I am not afraid to go into communities and find out the real root of the problems. But I would love for all of the representatives for that city to have to do that as well. The third thing that someone and last that, that some people misdiagnose as apathy comes from suppression like racial gerrymandering. 
There are generations of African-Americans that live in the 95th and the 92nd district that know and see the games that were played. So when some people say my vote doesn't matter, we've got to shame the devil, tell the truth. It didn't because we, we they in, in 2011 drew it so it wouldn't. And so it wasn't until the court case in 2019 when constituents raised the issue and sued in federal court that they won and those districts became fair. So you have some folks that have been living here for generations and the first time they, they voted in a fair district was 2019 because the federal courts created it. Now, Ben, some of y'all get to walk around here saying one man, one vote. <laughs> and then some of us are like, no, nah, we're still waiting for that. And that is why it is really important that we end gerrymandering in a sense so that every Virginian's vote actually does weigh the same. And you can kind of transpose the conversation of political gerrymandering on the same. If a district is drawn so that a Democrat or a Republican never has to talk to the other side, that's, that's, that's suppression as well, you know? And so you can just, it's kind of the same sort of summary. I just think that it has been specifically targeted against African-Americans for so long that that's the racial one is the one that first comes to mind. And speaking of, that's wonderful. Speaking of political gerrymandering, you mentioned, you know, the vote for HB 1255 fell along party lines, right? Democrats unanimously supported it. Republicans unanimously opposed it. Whereas we've seen with with Amendment One that it's actually heavy heavy Republican support, although in the Senate there was a broad bipartisan, in the House uh, not not so much. Can you talk about how political gerrymandering is kind of playing into uh, the the redistricting process that we, we're going to have moving forward? Amendment One, HB twelve fifty five. Yeah, so Amendment 1, as you all have, have covered, uh, but Amendment 1 is just for those that might be freshly tuning in and might have their ballot sitting in front of them <laughs> and they're confused. Um, amendment 1, uh, so right now redistricting is done through a bill process. So it goes through a subcommittee, a privileges and elections uh, committee, then it goes through the privileges and elections committee, then it goes to the full house and the same with the Senate, and then it goes to the governor for signature. So it's just like any other bill. So in the uh, absence of that, what Amendment 1 is proposing, which I disagree with, is creating, instead of 140 voices voting on it with the governor's signature, uh, it is creating a commission that has been called bipartisan and it has been called independent, uh, but it is neither. It is it is hyper-partisan and, um, and definitely not independent. But you imagine this table where you have eight legislators who are currently elected. Now, mind you, some of these elections happen uh, in still gerrymandered districts because we haven't fixed the Senate, uh, the Senate maps yet. But eight legislators, four from the House, four from the Senate, and then the party leaders that pick them come up with a list of people that the judges choose from. And so eight of our friends get to the table. So there's 16 people that would be drawing this. Well, what we've seen in other places when you don't have a truly independent commission is with the presence of incumbents at the table, you end up with an incumbent map where it's equally politically gerrymandered and they strike a balance and a deal as opposed to fully coming from citizens and, and the, the census data where it um, really comes from what would have been the product of a citizen-led commission. So. Partisan gerrymandering is what people are accusing the Democrats of wanting to do because they're saying that we're saying no to Amendment 1 so that we can do that. But then they are uh, uh, not dealing with the fact that House Bill 1255 exists and ties our hands and we pass it. It says no political gerrymandering. So what, what has happened before? And this, this is really what, what can happen. This is all done by software. And I don't know if, if everybody understands that. So I can pull up a map that says, I want districts to be super, super Democratic or super, super Republican. And then you can start as that base and then pull from there and then make sure that it deals with the Voting Rights Act or whatever, and you know, legal, legal things after that. But you can literally adjust the lines and then get analysis from the districts to say, this would probably be more Republican or this is more Republican leaning. And they use 
previous election results as as the kind of marker. So that is how you get this situation in Virginia where people are like, I just don't understand it. The state feels so blue. Why was the you know state legislators so le legislature so red? When you have you know the the president, the United States senator, the, most of the uh, members of of Congress excuse me, the governor, the AG, the LG, all from one party, but another party running. And that's how it happens because they did it on a census block level of let's pack all of these Democrats here and this and that. So it is literally manipulating a map to get to a particular desired outcome of party as opposed to having the map reflect the demographics. So it's manipulating the demographics to get to a desired result, as opposed to drawing it based to show what the demographics show. And how is 1255 different? How would it move to end partisan gerrymandering? Yeah, so it, it basically says that the map shall not when considered on a statewide basis, unduly favor or disfavor any political party. So if you have these results that say, huh, Virginia has shifted over the last 10 years, and now this is what it looks like on a state level, then why would the state legislature look different <laughs> than what that is? Or if, you know, by, by virtue of whoever's at the drawing table, utilizing political data as the number one thing that they're using to draw the maps, then you know something is afoot. And so, so it literally is saying you can't use this to get to the maps, just like with race. You can't use race to get to the map. So you can't say, all right, show me where all the black people are. All right, now we'll start, we'll start from there, <laughs> you know? And that's, and that's what, um, literally has been happening for the last however long that this software capability has has arisen and what um what it really helps with is uh the other part for the for the racial gerrymandering amendment one points to outside things to really set the standard for ending uh racial gerrymandering so it itself does not end it it points to other things. Well, those other things, either one existed under Jim Crow and did not prevent Jim Crow, uh, which was the time between when women got the right to vote and black women got the right to vote. So if you'll remember those 45 years, but um, 1965 is the year that our country truly became a democracy, if you include black voices, right? So the language of the Voting Rights Act, which is under attack of the federal level, is in House Bill 1255. You do not have to point outside of the bill. It's in it. There's the link. Read it for yourself. It's not this one sentence where it says, you know, we'll make sure that you guys can pick your people. Because then remember, we were able to pick our people under packed maps, right? If, if the Voting Rights Act under Whew, what seems to be a newly coming United States Supreme Court justice who would not answer the question about whether or not they would support the Voting Rights Act if it came before them, which we know is going to be one of the first five cases to come before them. Um, if we don't know what this other thing is doing, history has flipped. From my eyes and my perspective, I can no longer trust the, the federal courts to be the savior of civil rights. And so now it's flipped to where states' rights and the states are having to take over and be the ones that are really driving the protections for people of color. Now that's a flip because we used to be fighting Bull Connor and Thurgood Marshall went up there and fought for some things and all of that. So now it's a flip. But with that, that means that the explicit protections have to be equal legal standard to making a district compact. And so, Ben, I'm going to jump a little bit into the weeds. So constitutionally right now, a district has to be compact. And that means it can't be sprawled out all over the place. It has to be compact. What that does not take into account for places like Newport News is that if you put a nice little pretty circle, a nice little pretty district on the map. What you're not taking into account is the history of redlining or the 
practice of redlining as it exists today. And that is where there are literally neighborhoods where black people were not allowed to live. And there are literally neighborhoods that black people that move into the area or are trying to find a home do not get shown homes in areas. So you end up with this pretty little compact district. But if you do not have all of the protections for communities of color at the same legal standard in the Constitution, then you're saying that that's OK, <laughs> that, that, oh, even though you can't live there, we're going to have this nice little pretty district. So sometimes the district needs to look messy. So that it is really, you know, by the civil rights um, uh, of, of communities of color. And so then people always ask me, why is it always about race? And this is the part. If we didn't have this history of black people being cut out and suppressed with intentionality and purpose, then I would not have to be so forcefully arguing that we are again being left behind when those protections need to be in place. So this is both looking back at history to see what has been done factually and historically, and then looking forward to make sure that we don't repeat those same mistakes. And that, it's great that you brought up the Voting Rights Act. I actually had some, some questions on that. And I just want to kind of repeat to make sure I'm understanding, hopefully our, our, our viewers are understanding. So as I understand it, HB 1255 specifically includes some protections that are perhaps modeled after the original Voting Rights Act. But as we know from the, the federal government in, in 2012 and, and possibly in the, in the near future, the Voting Rights Act will will continue to be scuttled and, and watered down a bit. And so to your point, it's it's very concerning to leave all the protections up to the, the federal Voting Rights Act. And as I understand, you're saying that, that Amendment <laughs> 1 does do that. It, it does kind of put the onus on on protection to the, the federal government, which, as you mentioned, is 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 a bit concerning over these, these past 10 years and and moving into the, the near future. Uh, can you talk about kind of why it was important uh, to include that and really how will HB 1255 empower uh, the voting power of the black community community and, and address concerns of, of disenfranchisement? Right. And, and I, I want to be clear that um, when we're when I am talking about the black community, because that is who has been targeted so heavy. But for my Latinx brothers and sisters, you were included in this, too. It doesn't just say black people. So let me broaden my language and say communities of color, because moving forward, that is really uh, the truth. I think I heard that by 2041, uh, there, that there will no longer be a white majority uh, across the nation. And I think that is really important to, to remember that as we're talking about a constitutional amendment, uh, I would 100% and wholeheartedly, okay, I'm gonna be nice this morning. Hey Ben, <laughs> good morning. <laughs> so you may hear that we'll just go back and fix it. And what I am afraid of is that people may have forgotten civics and how hard it is to change the Constitution and why we're fighting to get it right the first time. There is no such thing about just going back and fixing it. We have federally unconstitutional language in our own state constitution because we couldn't just go back and fix it. OK, so let me let me be clear when we have language that is there to protect communities of color who have been targeted and language minorities who have been targeted in various facets of our life as we've been just been trying to navigate this earth, then it is important not only for those protections to be there, but we can't just think about 2021, 2031, 2041, 2051. We are celebrating the 100th anniversary of one of our uh, federal constitution amendments. These things last for a long time and you don't just go back and tweak them because the constitutional process to change it is very different than a bill. So here is something that I want people to draw the connection to. And I saw some encouragement to get into the weeds, so let's do it, okay? When we saw that our Constitution left behind Black people with the 14th, 15th, and 19th Amendments, so yes, there's an equal protection clause that all laws shall equally protect communities of color, African Americans, we know that to be false because we experience life on a daily basis, right? So, and Jim Crow happened under that, and then Black men got the right to vote, 
through the Constitution with the 15th Amendment still. That was in place in Jim, under Jim Crow with the poll taxes, property taxes. Guess how many beans are in a jar? Fire hoses, dog bites, right? All of that. When John Lewis got beat on that bridge, both of those were in place. And so was the 19th Amendment. But again, it was not until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed into law that I argue our, our Constitution was then helped to create a true democracy. But please understand the Voting Rights Act is a bill. It's a bill. It does not have the same legal standard as an amendment in the Constitution. We could not get the votes for Congress to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act yet. Yet, in 2020, Mitch McConnell is not clamoring to get this done. Why? Because Black people vote really, really Democratic. And that's just, that's just the parts of it. Voter suppression is not by accident. Voter suppression is a purposeful, meaningful thing to them. They have said it. Well, if we let everybody vote, we'll lose. <laughs> They've said it. And I do not understand why someone would say something that does not end voter suppression in a meaningful way should not have the same legal standard as a compact district so that it looks really pretty on a map, so that it's easy for the incumbent to travel, right? So, so it's just this thing where even though House Bill 1255 has all of these things and all of these are in law, when we are looking at 1231, 1241, 1251, I'm not going to be there. <laughs> Senator Louise Lucas is not going to be there to save y'all because y'all, y'all, you know, everybody's like, well, it's going to be diverse because there's a black person at the table. First of all, black people are a monolith and we have seen disagreement on this. Right. Also, black people were involved with gerrymandering before. So y'all need to be careful about how many black people you put all these, you know, uh, things on our shoulders. But why is Louise Lucas the one that has to save diversity at the table? Why, why is this not something that the white man, let's say George Barker, would have to do as well and that we can agree to as a value statement that diversity is as important at the table as it is within our commonwealth? And that's just not in the, in the amendment. And so, you know, Louise Lucas is going to be there. Eileen Fillercorn, the first ever. Yes, all of these things are historically factu factual. How so and ever? If you look and see how many legislators plan to still be there in 2041, it's not any of us, right? Like, well, I, I do not, uh, for the record, I do not plan to be in the legislature in 2041. But, but that's my point. We can't just look at the Constitution and say, this is for right now. You have to look out into years and years and years, our children's children's children. And we get that. We understand that when we're talking about justices, because you hear everybody say, we need to or we need to not have a certain justice because of generations of case law that will come out. It's the same thing for our constitution. This is for generations. And so if you're gonna pass something that says we don't care about diversity as much as having a cute little district, then that is your value statement. Or we don't care to have the words of the protections in this. We're just going to point to somebody else's work that's actually under attack right now to say that's enough for communities of color. That's your value statement. But that is the value statement, if passed, that will be in place into perpetuity. Because just as you know, this could go away, House Bill 1255 could go away, so could the enabling legislation that we will pass should the amendment uh, come forth. So when you look at that amendment, you cannot bank on legislation to save it. And so as proud as I am of the work we have done in House Bill 1255, <laughs> which is not perfect, which is not perfect, but it is a huge progressive step that calls out uh, some of the activities that have been happening over years and years and years of Republican control. Uh, I, I do think that these things have to be in the Constitution at the same weight as the other uh, criteria that is in there now for it to be compact and contiguous. Sure. So what's the, the path forward or the next steps for 1255? Would it, would it work in conjunction with Amendment 1 if that were to pass? Or is it only applicable if Amendment 1 fails? Uh, are these protections heading towards a constitutional amendment in a few years? You know, that's 
that's a really good question. So House Bill 1255 became law July 1st, irrespective of anything else. And I want to reiterate, because some people ask me, well, why didn't you put transparency in there? House Bill 1255 solely deals with the codes that say how a district can be drawn. It does not deal with the who. Transparency becomes that part of the process. Who there, Who is doing it and the process of the redistricting. House Bill 1255 was a separate conversation that says no matter who and no matter what it looks like when they're doing the drawing, these are the things that it can and cannot do, right? And so, um, there was not going to be transparency in this bill because that's the people that will be doing the drawing and how it, you know. So even if the the bill passed that said that the um that the computers were going to do it, House Bill twelve fifty five, it would still have to be legally matched up to what we've set out in this. So House Bill twelve fifty five is in effect. So if somebody tells you that in order to end gerrymandering we have to pass Amendment one, it's just not true. And it, and it leaves out the hard work of both Senator McClellan and I, two black women, should I, should I mention, who disagree on this. We voted differently on Amendment 1, but we agreed and worked really hard to get this bill passed. It's kind of separate conversations. Now, where it has been interesting, and I'm not a lawyer, but is what is really fascinating is to watch lawyers talk about whether or not House Bill 1255 would be applicable should the Supreme Court uh, be who gets the maps. And I think it's going straight to the Supreme Court because of how you have this uh, scenario where you can have 14 people, including all of the eight citizens, every single one of them can say yes to a map. But if there are two uh, legislators from the same chamber and the same party, they can say no to a map and the map fails. They do that twice it goes to the state Supreme Court. Again, I'm not a lawyer. Y'all will have to bring the lawyers back to argue over whether or not law will tie the hands of the court or whether the courts, you know, um, because the amendment does, again, not have the protections and things and the criteria in it. Um, so that is a conversation for the lawyers, but that is a point that has been brought up, again, because it's just not the same legal standard. A bill does not have the same legal standard as a constitutional amendment, and that's why we're trying to get it into the constitutional amendment. And so just to recap to again make sure I'm I'm tracking. So as it stands now, House Bill 1255 has passed. It is law of the land. And in theory, we're, we're, it will be applicable to the next round of redistricting in 2021, whether Amendment 1 is in effect or not. Question is, if Amendment 1 were to get kicked to the, the court, which we the Supreme Court of Virginia, which we know is, is the kind of the ultimate backstop for uh, Amendment 1 is, go, is going to the the appointed uh, Supreme Court of Virginia, not it's unclear, legally unclear whether 1255 would be applicable. Um, but as it's not kind of in the in the constitutional amendment or in the Constitution, I mean, you mentioned that, that it passed by the skin of its teeth, especially in the Senate, 21 to 19. So there's there's nothing preventing it from being struck down in, in two years, four years, six years, but certainly before uh, 2031. Is that is right. that accurate? Yeah. And, and I know I, I say this all the time. If you're a student of history, you saw the pendulum swing. And so it might have taken Virginia 20 years to get to this current one. But I do believe that as we have more fair districts and if we can get to that independent redistricting where it's not an incumbent protection map, you don't know where it's going to go because it'll truly be competitive districts. And so that is the thing where it's like, I'm like, uh, OK. I don't really care who's in power. <laughs> like, this is not a democratic conversation for me. It's the same conversation that I've been having since 1996 when I, I wrote my International Baccalaureate Extended Essay on how gerrymandering is bad for Black people. Gerrymandering has been bad for Black people since it started and since the inception of trying to make sure that um, that votes were not equal for, you know, across uh, when, when the districts were being drawn uh, all the way through this historical perspective. And, and, and this is this is the historical context that I want people to understand. I am operating as if we are still in the middle of the civil rights movement. I don't think it ever ended. Uh, I don't think that the, 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 the work and the blood and the sweat and tears that went into the Voting Rights Act ended the civil rights movement. And so I can't say, oh, back then, <laughs> this is what we did. Because in 2018, 
the Democrats and the Republicans, again, <laughs> both parties, uh, had racial gerrymandering and political gerrymandering in the maps that they did it. Now, it was for different purposes. One was serious. They wanted the map to look like that. One was trying to prove a point to get the uh, to get it to the court um, so, because we knew that the court was where a more fair process would be. However, it is really um, interesting to note that at the presence of legislators, at the presence of legislators, at the presence of legislators, self-interest is at the table. And so that is why it was so important for House Bill 1255 to be passed because the inclination, whether you think it's because you have the moral grounding and that your party should be the one that's in charge or because you yourself want to be reelected, uh, either way, both parties feel like their agenda is right. So self-interest sits down at the table at the presence of legislators. So that's why the original intent for a lot of a lot of the uh, advocacy was for a completely independent, uh, completely independent uh, redistricting process. That is what I wholeheartedly believe. Uh, even with House Bill twelve fifty five, um, you know they 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 found a loophole at the Joint Reapportionment Committee this week. They found a loophole. They have um, they have voted against my protest with two of my colleagues. They voted to include incumbent addresses to be available for the redistricting process. Hmm. We've already started to draw an incumbent map yesterday, Wednesday, whatever today is, it was this week, <laughs> whatever day it was, I think it was Tuesday maybe, but we've already started the process. Legislators voted to allow incumbent addresses to be a part of the map drawing process. Wow. It's a it's a long process, and and I think you know certainly one that's been folks have been fighting for for years and years, decades. Uh, and to your point, it's it's not perfect even even this week, right? And there's there's still uh, challenges. So yeah, um, I know we're running up on time, and I, I imagine we got a, a bunch of questions on on Facebook. But is there any anything I've missed before we go to the go to the Facebook questions? Um, I, I would just say, you know, I, I saw a little piece in, in a Richmond paper about all of the flaws of House Bill 1255. And what I think is really interesting is the author of that, that bill, I mean, that, that article saw something redeemable in House Bill 1255 because he added it into his enabling legislation that was being carried as the buttress and the legislative fix for the flawed amendment. And so I will just offer that I understand that the back and forth is confusing. I understand that games are being played. Hell, the, excuse me, I'm sorry. Heck, the, uh, <laughs> the language of the amendment was written by the same people with everything that shows on your ballot. So your ballot is really a commercial in favor of the amendment. I, I understand all of this and I understand this tricks but I really felt like it was my duty to go out and why I am so uh, energized to tell the truth about this thing is because of the games that are being played. And so I get it. Politics is dirty, <laughs> you know, but it was important to me to speak out even when friends are on the other side uh, because people need to know what it is that they're voting on before they vote on it. And so again, listen to me. Go to the go to the link. Read the bill yourself. House Bill twelve fifty five is the law of the land. Right. Well, again, thanks. I mean, thanks so much for joining us and and informing everyone about HB twelve fifty five and 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 what it does. And and I think certainly it's something that that at the Interface Center and our members across the Commonwealth strive strive to do. Right. To certainly to end gerrymandering. Uh, to end racial gerrymandering, prison gerrymandering, political gerrymandering uh, are, are things we're all supportive of. And, and so we're certainly thrilled that, that you're passionate about it and, and committed to making that happen. And, and we hope moving forward that, that we'll all continue to make the Commonwealth better in that regard. Um, Roberta, I don't Absolutely. know if there's uh, Facebook questions. Um, I haven't, haven't seen it myself. So if there's a question or two, go ahead and, and put it up. Otherwise, we can... Here we go. Um, why are friends, Democratic friends, maybe League of Women voter friends supporting Amendment 1? Yeah, I, 
Yeah, Ben, I do not make it a habit to speak on behalf of anyone else. And so you will have to ask them. My question would be, why is going after the quote unquote greater good always the, the uh, argument as to why communities of color have significantly been left behind? I think of the Illinois uh, contingent that was there at the <laughs> at the women's suffrage parade and the entire discussion for that parade was whether or not if African-Americans were allowed to march with them, it would thwart the whole thing. And so they had to go to the back. And, and history shows that every time we're about to make a major step forward, we got to leave some folk behind in order to get that greater good. And that's what my question would be. Why are we continuing to do that when we could scrap this, <laughs> include everyone and have a better amendment and under 2021 go with the process with, uh, with gerrymandering being illegal and get to an even better amendment. And so people say, well, don't kill the good for the perfect. And I'm like, my excuse, exclusion the exclusion of diversity at the table, the exclusion of these specific protections for communities of color is not good. It's convenient <laughs> for those that want to plow forward, but it is not good. And so, uh, so I don't subscribe to that. But uh, you would have to ask them uh, why they are um, why they are so for this. And can you expand on that before we get to the next one? Just you mentioned, you know, kind of an alternative path forward with 1255. Could you explain yeah. to our viewers what, what if Amendment 1 were to fail, what would be the path forward for 2021, 2031, et cetera? But I have to credit my, my colleague, Delegate Levine, for really honing in to this point. But there was a bill that I carried, House Bill 1256, that originally created an independent commission prior to the legislature drawing, uh, excuse me, voting on the map. So the citizen, would the citizen, all citizen, and it has a completely laid out, you can't be family, you can't be lobbyist, you can't be ex-legislator. So this group of true citizens that would apply to be on the commission and chosen by a non-legislator would draw the maps and then the legislature would vote on them. Um, there are plenty of things that we could do legislatively. Even the governor could issue uh, some some uh, mandated guidance on how this thing would go. Uh, so the, the constitution would still be there so that it would still be voted on by the legislature, but the same way that Amendment 1 does. So we could legislatively put together whatever process the people want. I think we've come up with a really, really good one in 1256. The issue that Levine brought out is minus Amendment 1, the Republican bill, you know, <laughs> from uh, Mark Cole in the House, minus that, would the Republicans like the committee process or the independent process. And we still think that they would go for the independent process. And so the Democrats that want to have legislator control at the table, who are the absolute obstacle to independent, actual independent redistricting reform, they would be the ones still pressing for us to keep it with the legislators at the table. So it would be a flip. But I think minus Amendment 1 being in the mix, voted down, we have a strong legislative process where citizens actually will lead the process and legislators have to follow their lead. And so this is not an all or none. And I also think we are 85 to 90 percent of our way to the new amendment that we could pass in 2021, which is the odd year which amendments get passed, pass it again in 2022, send it to the people, and then we've already protected ourselves for 2031. So it, it doesn't have to get done this year is what you're saying? Not at all. This is not a do or die moment. It's just not. Got it. And we have a question there. How will the census impact gerrymandering at the, at the state level? Yeah. So the census won't impact gerrymandering at the state level for 2021 because we have House Bill 1255. But what I think Amanda meant uh, for the census, and I'm not trying to put anything on you, but I think she meant redistricting because gerrymandering is illegal. But the census, um, one of the more disappointing points of how polarized and political this nation has become is politicizing the census. The census was supposed to be everybody that lives here get counted. 
period. <laughs> like that's what it was supposed to be, right, Ben? And, and so the fact that we had folks that were trying to literally say, but not you, <laughs> no, no, you can't be counted or make it harder for certain communities to be counted. It lets you know what was happening. But if we didn't know there was the guy and I'm blanking on his name, but his daughter released his papers and literally the census was, this was a guy out of North Carolina that designed uh, census suppression, voter suppression, all of that, because it's, it's linked. So one of the things that, that the census data is used for is like I said, when we sit down to draw the lines, whoever that is, it is based off census data. If you have excluded people from that census data, then you have pulled them out of the redistricting process where their voices are not present in how the maps are drawn to even know if the maps are drawn fairly. And so it is really important, or it was really important as they're coming to a close with the counting, even though the courts told them to keep going to the 31st, but, but hopefully all of those that were counted, that's the data that we'll be using to do the redistricting. Now, if we are allowed to uh, later after 1255 gets struck down, that is the census data that will say, oh, this is a Hispanic neighborhood or this is a black neighborhood. That's how packing was done, was by using census data. But again, want to reiterate, that's not how it'll go. Uh, if we, Even if we strike down Amendment 1, because it actually doesn't protect against that, uh, but House Bill 1255 is in place for us not to do that kind of gerrymandering uh, for 2021. That's great. All right, well, that looks like we are out of questions. Uh, and again, I know we, we ran a bit long, but it was a, a great conversation, certainly very informative. Uh, I hope our, our, our faithful citizens uh, that we have across the Commonwealth are, are more informed. Certainly, we, we cannot encourage people enough to vote. Uh, vote, 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 November 3rd, uh, very important, or, or vote early. Uh, I know there's a lot of early voting uh, available across the Commonwealth at, at this point. so. Again, and I want to thank, yes, just, go I'm ahead. Sorry, just because you have such a huge platform, I want to remind people that they have about 12 more hours to register yes. to vote because the deadline was extended. So if you have any family or friends that need to register, change their address or check the system to make sure you are active in the system, you have 12 hours to do that at the electoral site, elections.virginia.gov. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Please register and please vote. And I cannot thank our guest enough, Delegate Sia Price. Thank you so much for your time and, and your wisdom. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you in person uh, at the General Assembly, hopefully sooner than later. Um, but uh, thank you for, for being a champion for justice for all these years and thank for you. all that you do for the Commonwealth. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>